at Flat Six Innovations Research and Training Center here with Jake Raby. We've done a couple of segments to learn about what an IMS bearing is, what the IMS is, where it's located on the engine, what its function in life is. We've learned about what we can do as owners of these 986s, 996s, um, what we can do to maintain them, to minimize the possibility of possible destruction, so to speak. Um, but then also, you know, when a bearing fails, Jake, you've shared with us the four stages of bearing failures. Um, it was a little, got a little squeamy at the end, but we, we survived and we got through it. So now we have to talk about, well, let's say we now have to move into a new bearing because we're doing preventative or the bearing that we had was simply destroyed for whatever reason. Um, what we've done is we've gone to a great supporter of PCAs and we've bought all the retrofit kits that are available at Pelican Parts. And what's not important is to talk about the brands, but what I would at, like to ask Jake to share with all of us is the technology. What is the difference in technology? Because if you take a cursory look at these bearings, they look all kind of similar to me. But if you take a close look, you'll notice seals, you'll notice um, thicknesses, you'll notice uh, the different way that they're attached or installed onto the engine. So we want to go through that. But before you can do anything, you have to take them out, the original one out of the car. Exactly. So as I said earlier uh, in the other videos, the IMS bearing was originally thought as something that is not a serviceable item. So someone s said that to you and, and you like challenges. So how did you take that? <laughs> well, Vu, somebody told me that you could not extract the bearing. And you just don't tell me that because I'll find a way. Challenge. <laughs> exactly, it's a challenge. At that point in time, I was on a mission to extract the bearing from the engine. And, and I succeeded not very easily, but it just took some old 914 pieces I had laying around, some stuff from a local hardware store, and a couple of evenings, and I fashioned a tool, uh, and that tool has been refined many times, and I ended up making tool kits. LN Engineering sells those tool kits to pretty much everybody out there that's doing this job um, because it's the only tool kits available. And it's very simple. There's really, it's a simple procedure to do if you follow the directives that we've come up with. So it wasn't just the tools, it was the procedure that followed it. And that procedure has been revised as we've learned new things about, you know, don't try to save an engine by changing a bearing or whatever, you know, don't, you want to mitigate those losses. Don't do anything that's kind of crazy. Don't, don't take risk. Go ahead and pull the engine apart. So I, I, I'll stop you right there. And just because, you know, as you're looking at different solutions for your engine, I think what's important is not only having the tools, but as I'm playing with uh, this, this booklet here is having the right process to do everything, to take the time and make sure that the product has been researched. And when you go to replace, the equipment that you have step-by-step -step instructions so that you do it correctly. Absolutely, because with this stuff, most of the mistakes that are made during an IMS retrofit procedure are made in the first five minutes. And the biggest mistake is somebody doesn't put the engine at top dead center. Like when I watch you through changing your chain tensioner on your nine, mm -hmm. on your Boxster, I said that's the first thing you do. And the next thing is they don't pull the tensioners out. So that, those are two big things. They, don't, they do the process at the wrong crankshaft position and they don't remove the hydraulic chain tensioners. And if you do either of those two things, you're gonna goof it up in the first five minutes and it completely throws off the cam timing of the entire engine. And, and you, you, it, you're starting over and you're buying $1,000 worth of tools to retime the engine, where if you have the proper instructions, you have the proper procedure, then you're going to be able to avoid that in its, in its entirety. So let's take a look. We have a wide range here, but I know that we are, um, you know, we could have had, I guess, a lot more parts here because we're talking about um, the early double row uh, intermediate shafts as well as we're talking about the serviceable, um, the, the middle range single row bearings. And then you've got the uh, 05 and 08 cars. So we've, we've taken out of the equation, so to speak, in terms of looking at bearings, the double row, and we've taken out the, uh, the larger single row bearings. And Absolutely. The reason for that is? Well, we can't be here all day. Yeah. And the, the, the bearings that have the biggest problem that 
is factual are right, the but, ones that were that were covered under the Eisen versus Porsche class action lawsuit, and that is the single row cars. Those are the the mid year two thousand up to oh five model year cars that had that single row IMS bearing. So and that's what we're going to focus on on the table here. They're they're the lightest duty, the weakest, and the most likely to fail. And there's actually the the widest array of products to address those particular engines of all. Okay, well let's delve into it. Okay, so in no particular order, we're going to go over the different types of technology that, that can be purchased uh, to solve any IMS bearing problems you may have. Uh, and, and hopefully you're gonna do this preventatively. Uh, elective jobs are what you always wanna do. So this particular kit is the one that's closest to the factory kit. You notice here, it has a seal on both sides. Uh, this particular bearing is a conventional bearing. Um, it is permanently lubricated with the grease we talked about earlier. Um, it does have a different center stud and a different nut, so it doesn't look entirely like a factory bearing, um, but it's underneath this seal, you would find that it is a conventional ball bearing, uh, just like what the factory would use. And this particular kit is unique in the fact that it's universal for single or dual row. You know, we talked about the differences in the in width of the bearings. This kit is one kit that is universally ac applicable to both single and dual row uh, applications. So with this spacer in place, it is a dual row width. With the spacer removed, it is a single row width. And of course, the kit comes with snap rings and installation materials. Uh, a new triple lip seal that is made to go in your original bearing flange. So this is the only kit we're going to go over that does not incorporate in the kit its own bearing flange that bolts into the crankcase. Okay, so here we have a cylindrical roller bearing. And this bearing is a conventional bearing. It's not a ceramic hybrid. You're gonna hear that term quite a bit. But the cylindrical roller bearings um, what, what really separates this one is the fact that it has integral thrust support. So typically a roller bearing of, of cylindrical design uh, has very little ability to control longitudinal thrust. Uh, and we've already learned that the ball bearing in this application suffers from extensive uh, loads from thrust. So the cylindrical roller it doesn't inherently control thrust unless a special bearing is utilized that has thrust control capability built into the bearing. And that's what this particular unit does. Uh, so this looks like a seal, but it's really not. It's just a retainer that is there to hold the, the cylindrical rollers in place. Um, you can see the back side is also open. You, as you see here, um, it has an updated center stud and of course, a, a, what we call a jet nut or a 12 point uh, aerospace type nut just like the previous kit we talked about no real differences there this kit incorporates its own billet flange um, and it's made to specifically fit with the cylindrical roller bearings width okay the next kit we're going to evaluate here and go over the technology this is a ceramic hybrid single row replacement bearing. Uh, this particular bearing has a larger diameter uh, inner stud, as you can tell. It also has a larger diameter nut. I'm not gonna install that one because it takes up the vast majority of the space on the bearing here. Uh, this particular bearing is also sealed. You see it's sealed on this side and also here as well. It also comes with a replacement bearing flange. Um, this particular bearing is of the same exact replacement dimension as what the original factory bearing would be. So um, it's a lot like the first kit we talked about, except it is a ceramic hybrid bearing. It is not a conventional bearing. Uh, it still has the same amount of balls, the same amount of races, uh, the same amount of, of cages. All those things are the same as the very first bearing we talked about, except this one is has ceramic balls, making it a ceramic hybrid bearing, not a conventional bearing. Okay, moving on, we have what is referred to as a dual row bearing that is of European width. Now, the unique aspect of this particular technology is while it may be a dual row bearing, 
It is very thin in comparison to that of the original dual row bearing, which you can see here. So I'm holding them uh, pretty much the same on one side, and you can see how much more narrow this European width bearing actually is than the factory dual row bearing. So what's unique about this particular bearing is it has two rows of balls and cages and inner and outer races here, but basically that is made to fit into the confine of a single row shaft. So this gives us the load carrying capacity of a dual row bearing, which is very similar to that of the cylindrical roller we just talked about here a couple of technologies ago, but it does this in a ball bearing that is also ceramic hybrid. So uh, this is a lot like the previous technology we just went over in the fact that it's ceramic hybrid, but it has two rows of those ceramic ball bearings instead of just one. Now, what also separates this particular bearing is it is required for installation is the IMS faultless tool, okay? So this particular unit has a tool that compresses a wire lock here and the bearing is then delivered into the engine mechanically. So there's a chamfered edge that compresses the wire lock like so and then this end goes up to the intermediate shaft. The bearing is then delivered into the shaft and the wire lock then expands and holds the bearing in place. This is required because this bearing's width is so great that we cannot use a conventional circlip like you normally use when doing your IMS retrofit. So again, similar load carrying ca capacity of a roller bearing, but it fits in the confines of a single row shaft and is a dual row European width bearing. Okay, the last technology we're going to cover here is much different from everything else we've covered thus far because it is neither a cylindrical roller bearing, nor is it a ball bearing, nor is it ceramic hybrid or anything of that nature. What this technology is, is basically a plane bearing technology. So here we have a bushing that is a specially designed alloy actually, that goes into the back of the intermediate shaft. This is actually delivered in the back of the intermediate shaft. And this special flange simply slides inside of it. Now, what you haven't seen thus far is how this actually works. So this particular technology utilizes pressure-fed oil that enters this port that we're seeing right here after being delivered from a special spin-on oil filter adapter that basically screws onto the bottom of the engine in the factory oil filter location. It incorporates a threaded bung here that takes filtered oil from the oil filter, sends it through a fitting into a hose, and then this hose goes into the flange, and this provides pressure-fed oil through this orifice here, which then is delivered to this radial surface here and the longitudinal surface here. So what this does is the plane bearing, it rides on a special film of oil. So this is basically uh, working like your main and rod bearings inside the engine. So in a perfect world, the friction that you see between these two components would never be here because a, a pressure fed film of oil is going to support this particular component. So you don't have any metal on metal contact. This one also has a diamond like carbon coating on all surfaces. So this is DLC or diamond-like carbon to help protect it during, uh, mostly during cold starts or dry starts. After you've changed oil or the car set for a while, uh, this is a, a nanotechnology that works exceptionally well for surfaces like this. And what retains this particular bearing in place is a stud that goes through the center, passes through here, and then a similar aerospace type jet nut would go in that position and retain everything. This kit also includes a special socket to install this with since the clearance is very tight there. Um, what really sets this thing apart from everything else is the fact that it, it's missing a lot of moving components. So, you know, basically one would argue there's no moving components. Some would argue there's one because this is inside the intermediate shaft. Um, 
Real, realistically, the point with this particular product is that you have a pressurized film of oil that is supporting all the loads of the intermediate shaft, which is much like that of the Metzger flat six engine, or what we talked about earlier with the 547.4 Cam Carrera. Um, and it, it almost backdates the technology to that of an air-cooled Porsche engine. <laughs>